Welcome to the fourth annual UVM Extension Industrial Hemp Conference. I'm Heather Darby, and I am an Extension Agronomist here at the University of Vermont, and have been hosting this conference with my larger, much larger team than I um, over the past few years. So I just wanna give a, a quick shout out to my team that's helped put this program together, um, especially Susan Brulette, who works behind the scenes. Everybody sees her name, but they rarely see her um, sitting in front of the screen talking as I do. So we need to always make sure that uh, we thank Susan for all of her hard work. And also wanna thank UVM Event Services, who is um, helping us put on the virtual conference today. And they've been really great to work with and excited to have that partnership and capabilities right here at UVM. Um, besides UVM Extension, we have a really strong collaboration with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture here in Vermont and really wanna thank Stephanie Smith and Michael D. Tommaso for their continued support of this conference and all the other work that we do here with Hemp in Vermont. It's really wonderful to have that close relationship with our agency of ag. And then also wanna thank our funders who have been supporting the research and much of the outreach that we do and especially to the Northeast Risk Management um, Education Grants Program through the USDA. Now, our conference certainly wouldn't be possible with, with, um, without the support of our industry sponsors. And just wanna give a huge shout out to BIA Diagnos Diagnostics Laboratory, which lo is located right here in Vermont and Colchester. And again, they've been a great uh, partner for us here at UVM, helping us with testing service, testing services for hemp. Um, and Downhorse Instrument Company, who we've worked with for years as well, not just with hemp, but also with hops. And they've been a wonderful supporter of our outreach and research. And then, of course, King's AgriSeeds. They have been wonderful for us to work with and support our outreach. Um, in hemp, as well as many other programs that we do. And just really want to thank Sarah in particular for all of her support of our hemp work. And Farm Credit East, um, what's really great as the hemp industry has developed, we have some banking partners now. And that's really exciting to see the bank ag banking industry really start to branch out into diversified ag. And I, I see that with a number of banks, but again, Farm Credit East always providing support to help educate farmers um, in different crops, as well as the other kind of standard industries we have here in Vermont. And finally, thanking Neptune's Harvest Organic Fertilizer, again, a constant supporter of our programming, and we appreciate that. Okay, so with that, I'm going to um, introduce Andrew Jermolowitz, who is the Director of the Business Development Div Division um, for, Andrew, I want to say um, risk management. Is that correct? I don't Real see it actually. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I didn't see it in you. I should have asked you when I saw you um, getting prepared for your presentation, but it, it's not in your not in your bio. All right, so he oversees the cooperative services and public-private partnership branches, and he leads the development and execution of policies and strategies to better engage in collaboration with other federal partners, private sector companies, and other stakeholders to support economic development and uh, economic, geez, need more coffee this morning, development in rural communities. He also oversees the Biobase Markets Program. Um, since 1986, Jermolowitz has served in multiple program and policy positions within rural development and maintains interest in rural business development, so fits really well for our conference today, value-added agriculture, food systems marketing, and biobased economic development. Um, and I see that you are also a University of Kentucky grad, which makes sense. Oh, that, yeah, <laughs> that you and Tyler are talking basketball um, and, <laughs> 
and such. So Andrew, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to join us this morning. And we look forward to hearing about what's new with hemp in rural development. Well, uh, thank you, Heather, and good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here uh, to join you on this. Uh, over the years, hemp has become a, um, a, uh, a, a, a something I'm become increasingly interested in. Uh, there's, a, there's a part of it uh, you know, that fits well in our rural communities, and I'm, I'm going to be here today to kind of give you a uh, try to do a brief overview of rural development uh, within USDA and more specifically uh, rural business cooperative services and some of the programs that we offer that uh, may be um, useful for uh, 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 hemp producers and uh, hemp businesses. Okay, so that's me. Um, I want to advance. There we go. Um, just give you a quick overview of rural development. Um, we, RD is one of the eight mission areas within the department um, through our three agencies, Rural Utility Service, Rural Housing Service, and Rural Business Cooperative Service. Uh, we offer loans, grants, loan guarantees to help create jobs and support economic development, provide essential services such as housing, healthcare, first responder services, uh, first responder equipment, water, electric, and telecommunications infrastructure. Uh, we promote economic development by supporting loans to businesses through banks, credit unions, and community managed lending pools. We offer technical assistance and information to help ag producers and co-ops get started and improve the effectiveness, effectiveness of their operations. Um, so we're, we're working you know, to try to ensure that there are you know, safe, um, homes, housing in rural, rural, rural communities, uh, that they have adequate water and sewer systems, access to broadband, and a wide, wide array of uh, business development services. So we are pretty much a economic development uh, agency for rural America. Uh, to just give you an example about how big we are, uh, RD administers over 40 programs um, and with annually about $50 billion. Our current portfolio of investments is roughly, um, it, it's north of $220 billion, which makes rural development a, uh, the equivalent of a mid-sized bank. And how do we get all this done? Uh, well, uh, we are organized as we look at, you know, at regions. We probably have the four, four regions of the country, but our, the key to our strength is our network of state and area offices. RD supports 47 state offices and 400 area offices, one national office uh, here in DC. Um, our field staff is the strength of the organization. Uh, these, this is where the, the, the action really happens. And the, why I think RD is so successful is that the people that work for RD live in the communities that they, they, um, they assist. Uh, you can find a list of the RD state offices uh, at www.rd.usda.gov. Each of these state offices is um, run by a political appointee state director and a business program director. And I just want to give a quick shout out to uh, my friends in the Vermont, New Hampshire office, state director Sarah Waring and the uh, business programs director Cheryl Desharma. So that's how we get things done. And so let's talk about hemp and RD. You know, first of all, there is no hemp program within rural development. Our authority to work with this came out of the 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, the implementation of the Farm Bill uh, is being led by, as you all know, USDA's Act Marketing Services. RD is following the guidance and regulations that have been developed by AMS. And uh, so we are not specifically operating a target. You know, applicants working with hemp produced under an, uh, a USDA approved federal or um, state or Indian travel plan in accordance with the AMS uh, regulation uh, may be eligible for our, you know, certain RD programs. Uh, we had encountered some confusion and when there were two programs out there, the 2014 hemp pilot and the 18. However, um, I think as everyone knows, the uh, 2014 program expired at the end of January. So that's uh, actually helped us out. And so we're all working on a same, um, same program. 
And why we were looking at the 18, because the Farm Bill you know, set that up as a federal program. So when we're talking about access to federal dollars, having the oversight of the 2018 uh, domestic farm bill, uh, domestic hemp program is what was required for RD to really get engaged in working with hemp. Um, it is probably a little bit too small for many people to see, but I'll just try to run through this. Um, again, at, currently within the department, uh, the bulk of the work, discussion, communications on hemp has been on the production side. Um, Really, there hasn't been a whole lot of communications or that much guidance when we come on the on the commercial handling, processing, or marketing of hemp products. And honestly, that's where rural development steps in. Uh, I would also have to note that the 18 Farm Bill did preserve FDA's authority to regulate products containing cannabis or cannabis-derived compounds. You know, I know that's not cannabis is not hemp. We are clearly aware of that, but there are. Um, you know, FDA oversight here with some of the commodity or some of the products that make commodity and most notably CBD. Um, and, you know, due to the fact that the CBD has been used in a, a drug, which kind of complicates matters. Um, we continue to look at uh, hemp and uh, evaluate at the, on the legal and economic uh, I think our early assessments are that you know we see you know you know tremendous value in um, things like fiber, biomass, textiles, uh, bio-based products. You know currently have the greatest opportunity. Um, you know we do see the potential with uh, CBD. Actually, I believe um, there is something in the uh, you know the omnibus bill that is coming out where Congress has uh, I would say nudged uh, FDA to. Uh, expedite some of the process to come up with some determinations and guidance on how CBD will be handled going forward. So that's interesting. That's not immediate, uh, but we'll be definitely keeping our eyes on that. Um, and again, just we we are open. Uh, our programs are open to hemp producers. Uh, you know, we're treating hemp as you know just you know the farm bill, as it indicated, just another commodity. What we need is uh, for somebody to be participant. Is they're just going to have to meet the general eligibility requirements um, from a, you know, whatever is defined by our program, uh, whether it's an eligible app app applicant or uh, eligible uh, project type. So. Quickly jumping over here to uh, this is just a list of some of the programs that we administer at Rural Business Cooperative Services. Actually, we have a portfolio of over 20 programs. I've just highlighted the, the three that I was going to try to chat with you a little bit about today. And so we can just move on. And the first one is, you know, we refer to as our flagship. It's the Business and Industry Guarantee Loan Program. And it is, as it sounds, it's a guaranteed lo loan. Uh, in, in this case, the customer is our is the uh, the lending institution. We will work with them to um, you know essentially develop uh, underwrite the the loan agreement to guarantee the loan. Why is this you know useful? Um, you know, BNI is a risk mitigation tool. Uh, so when you have lenders who are a little uncertain or concerned or 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 maybe the project you know. Uh, Again, something like hemp, which is new, uncertain. Uh, a lender may be a little hesitant to come in there. Uh, they are uh, far more interested when they can see that uh, USDA is coming in, in with the project, uh, providing a guarantee. Uh, what we're talking here is a guarantee that can be up to $25 million. Um, and I believe cover up to 80% of the, the project cost. Uh, we have had some interest um, from lenders and uh, companies who are interested on the BNI side to um, commercialize a few opportunities with hemp. We haven't actually done one yet under um, uh, BNI, but I think given all the interests that we're seeing, this is something that we will be doing at, yet this fiscal or calendar year. Uh, again, this is going to be a you know a bigger program. It's a it's an access to capital program, uh, and you can envision that if you were you know new construction, renovation of a facility, you know purchasing of equipment, um, this could be uh, you know a, a program of use. Uh, the next program I want to talk about because now we're getting down to it's it's businesses, but it's also actually the hemp producers. Uh, I, it's a very popular program called the Rural Energy for America program. And what it does is 
uh, it's it's two parts, or it can be two parts. It's uh, uh, grants and loans. Um, you know, I, we're focusing here on this side is the grant portion of the program uh, can support energy efficiency, uh, energy improvements, or actually renewable energy systems. On the left-hand side is some of the items that qualify as energy efficiency. So if you're a business and you know, you're looking to upgrade lighting in a warehouse, heating, cooling, ventilation, um, you know, I can see uh, you know, irrigation systems. So you can use this program uh, to offset some of the costs of making these energy efficiency improvements. Uh, REAP can be, uh, we'll get into that, but it can be up to seven, uh, up only 25% of the project cost. Um, so, you know, if you have a, um, you know, $10,000 project, you know, piece of equipment you can use, you can use REAP to offset $2,500 of that. On the uh, renewable energy system side, the, we're energy agnostic. Um, so solar, wind, biomass, geothermal, wave are all um, eligible. Uh, activities. Another one in there that I don't think is listed. Oh, yeah, it is listed. Uh, anaerobic digesters. So very broad. Um, and really, I think the, you know, the goal of this program is to improve the profits for, you know, producers um, uh, and rural small businesses. So we'll go to a little bit of detail here about the grant piece on uh, renewable energy uh, systems, or I mean, on energy efficiency uh, is minimum grant. $1,500, maximum grant, $250,000. Um, same on the renewable energy systems. Again, it's a sys uh, there, minimum grant, $2,500, uh, a maximum grant request of $500,000. Again, these grant amounts can be only be up to 25%. So as the slide says there, if you did receive a $500,000 grant, that's based on a total project cost of $2 million. So. And I do have um, up there the you know, current deadlines. We run REAP twice a year. The first deadline was at the uh, beginning of the fiscal year, you know, November 1st. And we have a deadline for applications rapidly approaching at March 31st. Uh, again, uh, the, this is a farm bill program. So this program has funds and we will be running this program year after year. We're actually maybe hoping that the omnibus may bring some additional funds into REAP for this fiscal year. So follow the website. And what I would also, uh, uh, again, is you know, encourage you to get in touch with uh, Sarah and, and uh, Cheryl at the state office to talk about REAP. Vermont has been a strong state. Vermont has been very active in, in using this program. There's a lot of expertise out there, but it's a great program. And I would think, uh, uh, would hopefully some of the hemp producers would be interested in this. Uh, next part is, uh, this is, covers the loan. Uh, and again, this is, you know, it, it is, is looking on some bigger renewable energy systems. Uh, minimum loan amount, 5,000. As you can see, it can go up to uh, like the guarantee under the business and industry program, uh, 25 million. You know, here, you know, you are talking, I can, the, the biggest application that we see with this is solar. Um, we financed uh, multiple uh, larger solar arrays, whether they be uh, agrovoltaic or, um, you know, on a building or, or some other part. Um, you know, again, here we, uh, with the with the loan portion, we will be working with the lender. But there is the opportunity again for access to capital here if and when you are ready to go into this route. Um, next program I want to talk about is my favorite. I actually ran this program for a number of years. It's called, and I think it's probably one of the few that would be most relevant to hemp producers, is the Value Added Producer Grant Program. And it is um, kind of what it sounds like. Uh, what this is allows is an ag producer to take a commodity produced uh, uh, and it, whether it's changed in physical uh, um, sp you know, shape, uh, is grown under a um, you know, diversified technique, whether it's organic or, or something like this, you know, they, uh, you know, to produce this value added product. You know, the whole point is to allow that producer to capture a greater portion of the marketing margin, uh, allow them to develop, you know, grow, you know, simple examples have always been something like a tomato producer, you know, looking to, you know, uh, produce and market tomato sauce or tomato juice. Uh, we have actually seen uh, the program be used by uh, hemp producers. 
um, some of it for maybe a feasibility study and other ones, I think we were looking at a hemp flooring uh, project that came through. Um, you know, working through this, eligibility are independent producers. So if you are producing hemp and you are covered under a plan and licensed under a plan, I believe you will be eligible at producer groups, um, farmer rancher cooperatives and majority control produce based ventures. Um, the funding, uh, uh, maximum grant amount for working capital is $250,000 and $75,000 for planning grants. And again, there are two types of grants in this program. Uh, the planning grant, which is at $75,000, can be used to do a uh, cover the cost or offset the cost of a independent third party feasibility study or business plan. And uh, working capital can be for, again, it's not looking to purchase equipment. It's more of the um, you know, can cover some of the costs, some of the, um, you know, operated costs. It can, you know, it definitely can cover the um, costs incurred with, you know, developing the marketing plan, getting it out there to um, communicate and, and get a product uh, into the marketplace. Value added does require a uh, dollar for dollar match. So if you do get a $250,000, the program would, requ would require that the applicant put up $250,000. However, that is not necessarily all cash. It could be cash. There's opportunity the value of the crop, uh, a, a realistic value of the crop can be used to offset that match, as well as a limited amount of in-kind you know, time from the operator. Uh, this program is currently open. Uh, the deadline for application is uh, April 25th. I believe there's currently just under $20 million out there available. Uh, I do um, think that there may be some additional dollars coming into BAPG for from the omnibus um, you know, appropriation that we're waiting to see how that works out. So that amount may, may keep up. Uh, there is plenty of resources at the program website. Uh, this, this program can be a little bit challenging, but again, I, I would strongly re recommend that you look to the Vermont office has an incredible track record of using this program. And I just want to quickly uh, run through one because I was thinking it's this is a new, it's not new to USDA, but it's new to uh, rural development. And it's called the Bio-Based Markets Program or the Bio-Preferred Program. Some of you probably are not even aware of it. Um, I will just point out that if you're familiar with USDA's organic label, well, maybe you, you, know, you need to know that there is, USDA has a second program with, uh, that issues a label, and that is the BioPreferred program. It was established over 20 years ago, um, you know, basically um, you know, looking to find, you know, uh, seek innovative new markets uh, for bio-based products. Uh, the program uh, focuses on two um, aspects. One is federal procurement of bio-based products. So there is a actually in statute that the federal government um, procures uh, you know, to, the, you know, to the greatest ex extent possible um, uh, bio-based products. And so this can be from, actually we're looking at a few things here. Um, these are consumer-based products, uh, but whether it's, uh, you know, Motor oils, uh, you know, cleaning solvents, janitorial supplies. Uh, there's a ton of different things out there that are doing it. Um, so there's the procurement piece, but where what I think could be potentially relevant to hemp producers is the uh, actual label. And so a manufacturer of a product can submit, uh, you know, to the department through the program to have their product. Uh, tested by an uh, independent third party to determine the extent of bio-based content. Uh, they can go through this process, get this award or, or get the um, certified and have the opportunity to use this label in the marketplace. Uh, we've seen a incredible amount of interest growing in, in this program, uh, probably due because of all the climate talk and definitely the bioeconomy. And I see Heather coming up, so I know my time's up. Uh, quickly there, if you wanna learn anything about this program, uh, www.biopreferred.gov. And lastly, just uh, you know, a couple of points of interest, uh, the RD webpage, uh, contacts for the state offices, um, contact on some of the business program, my email address, I'm always there. Uh, you know, please feel free to reach out uh, directly and talk with me. So thank you very much for your time. I very much appreciated this. Uh, Heather, back to you.
Thanks, Andrew. And um, we, I appreciate all this information. I didn't know about many of these opportunities. And like I said, um, folks, you know, this will all be posted. Um, Andrew's got his contact info here. Maybe he'd be willing to put a little bit in the um, chat as well in case people want to get a hold of him. Um, <clears throat> there is one question, Andrew, uh, from Gary Fish. He's in Maine. I assume USDA RD resources will not be available to growers that license with a non compliant state hemp licensing program. Does that make any sense to you? <laughs> yeah, I think I'm okay. getting it. I mean, it's, uh, you know, that's one. I mean, I really, you know, there are some definitive things here where we have clear yeses and nos. I mean, uh, there, I mean, I would, I would like to talk. I think that's a, a, a good conversation, but I would think that if they are licensed on something that is not, um, you know, a plan that has been approved by, you know, AMS or the, um, you know, the department, either the state or the um, USDA plan, we're probably not going to be able to work with this. But again, it's always worth the conversation. Right, that's great. And then um, he was also wondering about the AVPG grants available to develop a greenhouse production facility to help a grower meet wholesale seedling or plug demands for hemp. Um, I think, um, you know, uh, you're talking, he's asking about a, a planning grant, correct? Yeah, I think what you would have to do is you just kind of look at, you know, again, do you have a producer? And it sounds like you do. Somebody who's producing seedlings are there. And, you know, you, we would want to talk about, okay, what is your value added product? And I think I'm hearing too, uh, you know, we have funded things like nursery where that they have grown, um, uh, you know, products for the, you know, uh, wholesale or retail markets, uh, you know, flowers or bedding plants or something like this, you know, through a greenhouse. So, yeah, I think, again, this is one that we would, I'd love to talk to you about, uh, but I do see potential that it's, uh, you know, applicability to the value added uh, producer grant. Great. Thank you, Andrew. We really appreciate all the information this morning. Awesome. Very thanks, for, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. All right, folks. Well, we we do plan in a small buffer window here so we can run over a tiny bit. <laughs> but um, I want to get right into our keynote session this morning. And I'm excited to have Dr. Jane Kulandinsky today and Tyler Mark. So um, Jane is here at UVM. We're so lucky to have her. She's a professor and uh, director of the Center for Rural Studies. She's also the Associate Dean of Research in CALS um, here at the University of Vermont. Her research program is best described as being focused on controversial food system policy issues. So I guess she's working in the right crop now. Um, and she has lots of collaborations around the country uh, working in this area. And she's going to be presenting today with one of our collaborators, Tyler Mark, who we've heard from here at our conference before um, in the past. And Tyler's an associate professor of production economics um, in the Department of Agricultural Economics at the University of Kentucky. And he's been uh, really engaged in hemp economics uh, really across the country. And uh, I'm just so pleased that they can join us today and talk about um, the National Hemp Survey and hemp trends and give us a little insight to maybe what's going on in the world of hemp. So Tyler, are you starting or is Jane? Well, oh. we're, we're, we're gonna attempt to, uh, to do a, a little bit of tag teaming on this presentation uh, and you know, we'll, we'll see how this plays out in a virtual setting. I know it plays out well in a personal setting uh, when we're face to face, but uh, we'll see how it plays out here. But so, Jane, if you want to come on and, and join in the uh, where everybody can see you. Well, I just want to um, thank Heather and her team for inviting us to give this keynote. And um, before Tyler takes the first half of the presentation, 
I just want to say be ready for a wild ride, folks, because um, we are going to cover everything from policy to production to consumer demand to regulation at a really high level and fast pace um, and at a fast pace. And um, I'll just give a plug for the next session, uh, which is going to be in, the, in um, later today, a graduate student session that um, will go into a little bit more detail of uh, several of the topics that we are going to give a high level overview of. So take it away, Tyler. All right. So I would echo the same thing Jane said, and, and thanks for the opportunity to present this. Um, yeah, and, the, and that session is going to go into a lot more detail. So let's go on and get rolling. Um, a little bit on the talk, you know, as Jane mentioned, we we're going to talk about some policy, some production, some consumption stuff that's going on. Uh, and there's lots of projects that we're both involved in uh, across the country on on many of these different topics. And we're going to try and hit some high level topics um, and high level thoughts that we've had coming out of those projects. The exciting thing about this is, is, is we really have a lot of actual data starting to, to come in and, and we can actually start to see some of these trends and stuff. Uh, maybe even a little better, well, hopefully a lot better than the anecdotal pieces that we've been talking about up to this point. So, you know, that's been kind of an exciting piece is now we're actually starting to see um, see the numbers back up some of the anecdotal things we were seeing or disprove some of those anecdotal things we were seeing. So that's been uh, pretty exciting. But I'm going to jump in. And I'm going to start talking about this hemp policy piece. And Andrew alluded to a little bit of this this morning. Uh, in his talk, when he started talking about the hemp policy timeline, and, and these are the major programs and things that have kind of come out in this. And, and thank goodness, you know, we had the 2014 Farm Bill that kind of kicked us off and, and got us rolling. Um, then we had the, the 2018 Farm Bill that came in with the interim final rule finally in 19. Um, things were supposed to sunset with the 2014 Farm Bill in 2020. They didn't. Then we get the final rule in 2021. And finally, we sunsetted. Um, all the, the pilot program from 2014 in uh, January 1, 2022 of this year. Now, that's really interesting in the way we had two different policies kind of going. We had different states uh, going with different policies. So Kentucky never moved to the 2018 Farm Bill until we got to, um, until we got to the January 2022 Farm Bill, or sorry, until we got to January 1, 2022, when that program sunset. So it's been really interesting, and you've had this real hodgepodge of uh, state programming around the country, and, and Gary mentioned um, Maine as well. So, I mean, you've got, you got different uh, states trying to go after different pieces. So the 2018 Farm Bill was really set up to kind of advance the 2014 Farm Bill, provide some clarification. It provided a little bit of clarification. The final rule helped with that a little bit more, but even still going into 2022, we've still got a lot of states utilizing and, and implementing a lot of different, um, it's not really a level playing field as you go across the country as different states are gonna implement different performance testing measures. And you know, we, we were trying to really think about how do we capture some of that and how do we look at some of that? And in a later session, uh, Amanda Faulkner is gonna talk really about a paper that we've, we've got in submission right now and talked about talks about the wording and how different words are you utilized in different state plans and what does that actually mean and are we creating a level playing field or are we still um, kind of all over the map on on what different states are going to doing and creating different competitive advantages or disadvantages depending upon the state with which you're trying to produce or process in so those are some things you really need to think about as we continue to go forward in this hemp industry and and it's going to continue to to change. I mean, you know, we've got the 2023 Farm Bill that's coming up. We're starting to see those sessions start to come into play. That's going to be another time for us to influence what all's taking place uh, for them from a regulatory standpoint from this. Uh, Andrew mentioned the omnibus bill that has some potential nudging of FDA. Um, we also had FDA just respond back to the Hemp Feed Coalition uh, in a letter as well. So we've got We've got lots of different issues going on there. Uh, there's still a lot of talk about 1% THC rules. So we'll see what uh, see where this industry continues to move forward, uh, you know, going, you know, into 2022 and beyond. So as of July 14 of 2021, which is where we kind of cut off um, the project we were looking at is we were looking at states that were both in the 2018 Farm Bill and the 2021, or sorry, 2018 Farm Bill and the 2014 Farm Bill. 
You know, so we, we looked through 67 independently approved plans. Um, there were six that were already licensed under USDA. Uh, there were another 20 that were continuing under the 14 Farm Bill, lots of drafting and lots of pending legislation in here as well. So you can kind of look at the political landscape we were looking through and the lens that we were trying to look at and see, um, see what all was going on. Um, and Amanda and her group did a great job of trying to sort this out and, and put these uh, states in, into, uh, into boxes and try and figure out what the content was saying about this and, and really help us uh, submit this idea that there is still a lot of, uh, uh, I won't call it misinformation, but it's inconsistent information uh, that we're seeing across these state plans. And I think that's something that uh, policymakers really need to be thinking about as we roll into the 2023 Farm Bill is how do we clean this up and how do we make a consistent policy so that everybody understands what uh, what the rules of the game are uh, going forward with this industry. And I think that's going to be pivotal if we're going to continue to push this industry forward. It also really helps uh, agencies like Rural Development, uh, NIFA, if they understand what the rules of the game are and who who's involved and where it goes. You know, I, knew, I know on a number of different grant applications I've gotten back is that they mentioned that we should have had another agency involved to, to help us tell the to to explain the rules. Well, not really, because we, we just don't have a clear understanding yet of, of where all those rules are going. So I think that's going to be something that uh, we really need to think about as we move forward within this industry. Fast forwarding, you know, the status of state and tribal plans uh, as of February 25th, you know, there are 96 approved state and tribal plans tribal government plans across the country. There's gonna be nine or so operating under USDA, um, USDA's program, and then like one more under review. So we've got, uh, we're continuing to move forward uh, with getting state plans and stuff put in place and states are still deciding whether or not they're gonna go with a, a state plan or a USDA plan. Um, and what we're gonna, is gonna be some really interesting pieces uh, come out of this. You know, if you look at the, uh, measurement of uncertainty on the THC rules. Each state's gonna kind of have uh, the ability to set what that kind of looks like to some degree, but each of the labs is gonna have a different uh, uh, level of uncertainty. So, you know, I could forecast and start to think about, are there gonna be people trying to shop labs um, to, to think about where they're gonna get their testing done? You know, and, and I think uh, USDA AMS is aware of, of, of these issues and these are things that are gonna have to get cleaned up, but, um, just some of the things I kind of see on the horizon coming. Um, you know, within the hemp plans, we, we really didn't know what all to expect. Um, the plans really were about regulation um, and trying to make a clear delineation between marijuana and hemp. Now, what I can say is that the hemp plans try and do that. But when I look at the consumer side, and I'll leave, leave this to Jane for later, uh, is that we really do have an education problem in understanding uh, consumers understanding the difference between marijuana and hemp. And uh, that's one of the things that uh, we can dig more into if we have a little bit of time. Um, you know, some of the key words uh, that were included in some of these common terms, you saw hemp in about 51 of those plans. So remember, we saw, we looked at 67 plans. Um, so, you know, they're they're not in all of them. You know, you see different uh, acceptable levels of THC and you get a wide range uh, of um, topics covered in here. So some states will use registrants, some states will use licenses. So there's still a lot of confusion in this space. And, you know, even like here, some use license, some use licensee. licensee. So they are similar terms, but they may not be the exact same term. Uh, and may not have the exact same meaning as you go from one state to the next. And Amanda can really dig into this and give you lots of detail uh, on how these words vary uh, from one plan to the next as uh, she took on the, the task of reading a third of, of the 67 plans um, that were out there. So uh, I'm sure she had some good sleep as she was thinking and reading through uh, some of those uh, riveting plans uh, that are out there. So uh, look forward to Amanda's talk later this afternoon. You know, we're going to try and transition now into to looking at more of some of the, the production side of this. So this is some work that uh, myself, Rebecca Hill, uh, Dan Mooney out at Colorado State and, and uh, 
a few other grad students are working on. And we're trying to really look at this expansion and contraction of hemp cultivation or hemp acreages uh, across the country and some things that we're seeing. So interestingly enough, we, we've kind of got, you know, as we all know that we had the peak in 2019. And ever since then, we, we've had some pretty heavy slide or pretty big slide back down in acreages. You know, and, you know, unfortunately, uh, we, we did have this CBD bubble kind of burst, but I think it's also given the, the industry a really uh, good opportunity and and to reset itself and to, to, you know, get out of this extreme fast growth that we were doing uh, and actually let some of the science, some of the research, some of the, the banks, some of the regulatory agencies catch up with what was going on. Uh, in the market and provide a, an actual, uh, hopefully, better playing field and uh, more consistent rules and regs across the country. Uh, and also allows, I think, uh, grain and fiber to come back into some of the story uh, that I think a lot of, uh, that originally in the 14 Farm Bill, where, where a lot of people were thinking the industry was going to go. Not to say that uh, CBD extract, uh, CBG, all those extracted pieces aren't going to play a role. I think they are going to play a significant role. It's just maybe not, uh, maybe more of a niche role or a specific role depending upon the cannabinoid uh, with which you're going after. So we had this big spike, but we tried to break that down and look at and look at states when they came in. So if you look at this group two states, those are the states kind of that second wave of states that kind of came in in 2016. They peaked up really high very quickly but also came down quickly. And you start to see um, the early states. So Kentucky, Colorado, uh, Vermont was in this pool as well. You know, we, we peaked in 2019 but and we fell, but we never peaked nearly as high as that second group of states uh, that kind of came in. Now, granted, there were there were more states in this space here. Uh, but so that, that all sets us a little bit. But we've all kind of come back down uh, to a lot of levels. I mean, you just take the state of Kentucky in 20. Uh, 19, we were at about 22,000 acres harvested. Uh, this past year, we were at about 1,300. So you start to see, and many of these states have come back down and dropped like that as well. Some of the states that came in in 18 uh, peaked off and kind of leveled off. They produced the same in 19 and 20, uh, and it kind of fallen back down a little bit. And then those last uh, kind of states have kind of held flat between 20 and 21. And we think there's a real story in here to look at the producers and how it came in and out. Uh, and that's some work that we're working on right now. You know, I'm going to pull in. Um, this is this is all out of the first national hemp survey done by NAS. It was released on February 17, 2022. Uh, I got the opportunity to sit in on some of the front end of this and talk about some of the questions and and talk about how some of the data was going to be collected and uh, got to hear a lot of basically how the sausage was made to, to some degree. Um, and, and it's kind of a, it's a rough and tumble process, especially in the hemp market. So I know many of you have probably looked at this data and you're probably like, well, where in the world did they get that from? And how did that come about? Well, let's try and demystify maybe a little bit of that here um, as we start to think about this, because there, you know, when this was put together, keep in mind, you didn't have all the 2018 Farm Bill. And the 2018 Farm Bill, it requires all producers to register with FSA and submit FSA numbers. So they had, NAS was trying to deal with a hodgepodge of states that had and had not uh, adopted the 2018 Farm Bill. So you had those 20 states that were still under the 2014 pilot program that those producers, if they had never had any engagement with FSA, probably never, never were going to have any engagement with FSA until they were made to have an engagement with them. So. So they didn't have information on those contact information to, to, to send them uh, surveys. Uh, so they were trying to collect that uh, via web scraping, via working with state offices. And I think they did, a, they did a very good job of that, trying to collect all that information. Uh, it's also another crop that's kind of interesting because under this crop, you may have had a producer that had two, three, four different licenses because maybe they were going to different processors. They were going to different... Uh, uh, they had different end products. So there could be a whole host of reasons why they had multiple licenses and stuff. And how do you handle that from a survey process? Do you send them multiple surveys? Do you only send them one survey and ask them to fill it out for all the crops they have? So there's lots of um, issues within the background trying to figure out how you sort that out. So those are some things that are going on in the background with this. Uh, you know, and if you try and compare this survey to FSA 
uh, data, you're going to see quite a few discrepancies. But this is going to get better over time. You know, and I'll talk about a survey that's coming up uh, at the end of this production piece here uh, and kind of forecast a little bit uh, as I let Jane get started into her piece. Um, but market value, they had about 824 million uh, in market value. Um, I'm struggling a little bit with this number. Uh, yes, according to the numbers they collected, it's correct. Uh, but, you know, when you look at some of the pricing stuff that came out of this survey, I think what you saw is some confusion on the producer side of did they sell it as biomass to go into the extraction industry or was it sold as a smokable because there wasn't a specific breakdown uh, within that. So that's something to think about uh, in there because you have different states like uh, some states don't allow smokables, some states do allow smokables. So we've got some stuff going on in there. Uh, the floor market made up about 70% of the total value, 75% of the total value that they had. Uh, Oregon was the largest uh, state out of that, and then Colorado, just to kind of give you an idea of, of sizes of these markets uh, as you kind of go with this. In terms of total, total floral production, uh, pretty interesting here. You, you know, you have uh, many of the, the an initial states, uh, at least those states in the first two groups, so Kentucky, Oregon, Colorado, uh, were early entrants into this and, and fairly large biomass producers uh, in terms of floral material. You also saw uh, Utah come in here uh, as well as California. So you can kind of see it spread out, but you got a lot, uh, a lot on the West Coast um, in terms of total floral production. Granted, total floral production probably in terms of licenses across the country probably make up 95% of the total licenses and total uh, acreages across the country. In terms of the floral markets, um, definitely the biggest floral market in terms of value was, was Oregon. It basically swamped everything else. Um, Michigan started to show up, Massachusetts uh, on the East Coast started to show up a little bit uh, in some of these. And a lot of these are smokable states. Uh, actually, I think if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, all of them are states that allow smokables. So, and that's one of the things where you saw Kentucky was a large producer of biomass or floor material, but we don't show up in this number because we don't really allow smokables in the state. So that's what I'm talking about as you go from one state to the next. So in the state of Kentucky, you, you cannot hold raw hemp material without a hemp license. So that basically renders smokable, smokables here um, non-existent. So, but these are kind of interesting when you start to look across the country and what kind of stories can you tell out of that. Grain, this is one of the areas where I really expect a whole lot uh, of growth as we go into 2022 and, and beyond. Now, the limiting factor on that, keep in mind, is how do grain, fiber, and floral compete with um, other commodity crops that are out there? So the corn, beans, uh, wheat, we're seeing record prices in those. Um, however, you know, I still think there are a few bright spots in this space, and I'll talk about that before I end up in my product before I end my production piece. Fiber, uh, this is another one that I'm really excited for. I, I know I'm really excited for Kentucky uh, in this space, and I think we have an opportunity to really produce fiber. Uh, but one thing that I would point out when we start to think about this is uh, 2,300 pounds, 3,200 pounds, 900 pounds, 6,200 pounds. You know, when I start to try and put these yield numbers in our budgets and stuff, and, and Jonathan Shepard's gonna talk about this a little more detail later on, is where I really start to see um, pricing and, and being competitive to purchase acres away is when we get up in that uh, four to five ton per acre type range. You know, we've got a long way to go with genetics to get there, but I think we will get there. Um, now, keep in mind that genetics piece really also plays into what is the end product that you're going for. Is it a textile? Is it a activated carbon? You know, is it flooring? Each of those has a different uh, quality profile that's needed within that. So making sure we, we balance yield with the quality piece uh, as we continue to go forward uh, within this industry. Uh, Montana, I expect to, to, to ramp up fairly rapidly, you know, as they have another processor coming online uh, in Montana. So I think these acreages are only going to continue to grow um, you know, and hopefully through some of the grants that Andrew was talking about, we can figure out how to get the infrastructure pieces in place uh, to, to make this side of the, the industry grow uh, quite a bit. So just 
to kind of briefly preface some of this. Um, now, these are the, some uh, 2022 draft budgets uh, that we're starting to put together for CBD production. Uh, this is for bare ground and plastic culture model. You can look down here at the bottom and returns above all specified costs. I I'm struggling to see where there's a whole lot of profit potential here. Now, let me caveat that. This is for the state of Kentucky. And I'm thinking about this. If you don't already have a contract in place, if you already have a contract in place and your pricing is above uh, these types of levels, or you may be in a place that's kind of a deficit area um, for, um, for floral production. So you may have some even higher elevated prices. So, uh, and also keep in mind from a CBD uh, percentage standpoint, I'm driving this off basically a 25 to one ratio of, of, TH, of CBD to THC. And also, you know, I'm also basing this on where you would, you would test that at. So you should be around seven and a half percent, but keep in mind, you got 30 days there um, that you can uh, let it grow after you've tested and got that final testing, testing sample back. So you very well could be above this seven and a half percent. You could be in a deficit area uh, where you could see some higher pricing. So you could see some of this improve uh, depending upon if you already have a contract in place as well. So that's something to think about. I am seeing a little bit of optimism here on the grain and fiber side. Um, you know, as if we can start to get up into this 12 to 1500 pound range here on the grain side, which would be comparable to what we might see in Canada, uh, who has a long history of that. Uh, pricing, if you were to go to an organic pricing type scenario, you'd probably look at over a dollar. Um, you, if you looked in the NAS survey, you're going to start to see stuff that's five and six dollars. I don't think that's really reality of where we're going to go uh, in this space, but uh you know, if you get up in that dollar, dollar ten, you get up 12, 1500 pounds, then this number starts to really look interesting. Fiber, kind of the same story. If we can continue to push this on up above the four ton per acre type line, uh, we can see a little bit of improvement in pricing. You know, then we start to see some returns that might purchase some acres away from uh, away from those traditional commodity crops. So we're going to change gears here uh, into Jane's side of this and talk about the consumer side. But in the background, I've talked about there is another uh, production cost survey coming. Uh, hopefully, we'll get that out in 2022. That's a joint project between uh, USDA AMS, University of Kentucky, and um, Colorado State University. And, you know, we, we hope to get that out in 2022. And it'll be a much deeper survey uh, than, than where NAS started at. But uh, NAS, was, NAS made a good first run at that. You know, I think we can continue to improve and improve the statistics that are out there for, for you all to be able to make uh, the decisions needed to move this industry forward. Jane. Thank you, Tyler. Um, so we're going to move into the consumer side of the market. And really, when you look, policy, production, consumption are all tied together. And some people wonder, well, does policy come down and drive the marketplace or does the amount produced drive the marketplace? Well, as a consumption economist, I would say that if consumers don't demand it, it doesn't, it, it really doesn't help a producer make a decision, except if there's no demand, there's going to be no supply. So we were able to, as part of our economic impact of hemp-based industries on rural America a grant, and um, that's from USDA, conduct a national consumer survey of over 2000 respondents. And we really base this on the um, Vermont experience that was also funded by USDA from a Hatch grant that uh, ended up being Hannah LaCasse's thesis. And she will be presenting in the next section as well. So Tyler, next slide. Sorry, I forgot to ask for permission. Oh, so now I can control. So let's see what happens. Nothing. Oh, there we go. So if you're interested in, um, in some pubs that are already out to look at uh, consumer demand for hemp, um, this slide just will direct you to those. So let's uh, have a look. 2,000 uh, consumers across the US. The number of hemp products that people have heard of excluding CBG. So we can see that most people are a quarter of of the sample heard of one hemp product, but there are plenty of people who heard of two, three, and four products as well, and a very uh, low number of people who heard of up to nine. 
So there, the word is spreading that hemp is more than CBD. And this is really where Tyler and I um, are coming from, what happens when the CBD bubble bursts. And that's where a lot of that production was. So we're really looking of whether or not this market can expand into grain and, and fiber. What were those products? Well, of course, CBD is, um, is the most hurt familiar product. But when we look, we can see personal care products, rope, of course, that's the, the quintessential historical product that's been made out of um, hemp. But personal care, clothing and textiles and food products are um, heard of by over 40% of our sample. Um, CBG, plastics, paper, and pet products less. But um, interesting that there are many, many products that have been heard of by consumers. So how did people feel about each of these? So this bar chart shows you from um, highly negative, which is the dark purple, to highly positive, which is the green, and don't know, which is that last gray, um, gray bar. And when we look at what people are most positive about, we can see plastics and construction materials, uh, very positive um, affirmations by consumers, but these, but not that many people have heard of them. If we go, if we were to go back to that last slide, paper, very positive, personal care, very positive. In fact, across the board, we see at least a quarter of the consumers being very positive about these products or positive. So um, there's a lot of potential in terms of how consumers feel their attitudes towards hemp-based products. And that is a first inclination that there is a, a future for this market. So um, here we have what people uh, believe is important about characteristics of hemp products. And I myself have to go close up to the, <laughs> up to the screen. But we see things like environmentally friendly, recycled, organic, natural, free of heavy metals. These are um, environmental characteristics that seem to be important for consumers. And I'm going to go back. I did not know we had a bio-based label. I look at the economics of information and labeling of, of products. But Andrew cited that um, bio-based products can actually carry a USDA label. That would be a, um, that would be an, a regulated label. And these would be more um, front of package labels that don't have uh, much regulation right now but clearly communicate certain characteristics of products to consumers. F an FDA label that's um, the bottom or FDA approval also is uh, seen as very important by consumers. Um, Tyler alluded to the fact of THC, what level of THC. We can see THC free and a 1% THC level and then the legal THC level. These are um, important but less important than the environmental characteristics. And again, this is a sample of 2000 US consumers. So let's take, uh, let's go out um, back into the global market here. It is in 2021 was a $4.1 billion market. And this pie chart just shows you where those, uh, those slices are personal care, food and beverages. Food and beverages is, is not a small slice. Um, textiles, a large slice. I love that Heather, one of Heather's uh, next sessions is, is titled something like uh, textiles or agriculture. Yes, indeed they are. So if we move towards uh, fiber hemp, the textile industry looks like that's a, a quite a big slice. So I want to move a little bit into the food market because um, Tyler, myself, Jeff Buzes from the University of Vermont have a Gun Catalyst Award to look at consumer um, stated demand for food-based products and the actual demand that's out there based on IRI or Nielsen uh, supermarket scanner data. So we can see that uh, food is a 2.12 million dollar industry uh, right now. And we can see that US hemp based food sales have been increasing uh, from 2012 to 2022 estimate. That's an estimate. So there is a growth potential to look at food based hemp products. 
When we look at IRI sales, it actually mim mimics uh, or mirrors what happened with production. So we see a, a rather steep increase until 2018, and then we see a decline. We can also look at where the biggest markets are. Now, um, Tyler and, and I and the rest of our team have been uh, sort of cogitating over this, this slide. Um, it looks like population centers are where you see most sales. But for someone who wants to market hemp-based products or hemp-based foods with ingredients, you still need to look at where those markets are concentrated. So we see Middle Atlantic, which is going to include um, which is going to include New York City. We see the, the um, East North Central, which is going to include Chicago. Um, and I'm a little bit surprised that the Pacific is not as big as it is um, in terms of food, but this, this is just a, a, gives us a sense of where the largest food markets are. Here we see a slide of total sales of food with hemp ingredients in supermarkets by supermarket department over time. And we've also thought a lot about this health, um, this health because you would think that the health personal care products with health claims might have been increasing. Not so because you're not allowed to put health claims on hemp-based products. So we do see that the food, um, the general food category increased and then we saw it as about half of what it was in 2017, um, hemp-based liquors and beverages seem to be a growing market. One of the major components um, of our USDA project is to look at the economic impact of hemp on rural economies. And um, Hemp Industry Daily set the standard multiplier for hemp at 1.9. What does that mean? It means for every dollar that we invest in hemp industries, 90 additional cents comes out and circulates through the economy. Um, so it, you know, what's very, very interesting here is that this standard multiplier set at 1.9, Rebecca Hill, our, um, our colleague who is an, an expert in economic impact and is part of the project, said, we, we mused together and we said, what does this 1.9 mean? Where did it come from? And indeed it said, it's a standard multiplier um, for industries. And we said, what? There is no, there, we don't know the hemp market. It's not built yet. Something called a social accounting matrix to get these economic impact factors. That is what our project is doing. So just to give you um, an idea, when we look at the impacts of a variety of industries, we can look at you know, private firms and utilities have economic impacts of four of uh, over four, yet we can look at re the retail sector just giving us 10 cents back in addition to every dollar. So identifying as 1.9 as the economic impact or multiplier for hemp really uh, doesn't make sense, but on average and overall, it was the best that we had. So we are actually building the social accounting matrices to estimate the economic impact of hemp and not only hemp in general, as Tyler said, these are, they're put in buckets, um, fiber, floral material and so on, but we'd like to disaggregate that a little bit. So um, we'll start with where we are right now. We have simplified floral sectors. So you go back to production, either greenhouse, specialty crop or row crops goes into the processing center, the processing sector and comes out and goes into retail, smokable CBD essential oils. Now, again, this is floral. We're doing the same thing with fiber and we're doing the same thing with the grain and seed sectors. Now, this is overly simplified. When you start putting these things together, you uh, start getting something that looks like this. <laughs> and, so, and so as we put numbers or percentages into each of these components and out at the bottom comes an economic multiplier for each of these products, each of these sectors, we look at how um, the hemp industry will impact the, um, rural, the rural economy, actually more than the rural economy, but we're really focused on the rural economy. We're getting there, it's, a, it's very complicated. 
Um, but I would like to say the way that we plan to set this up later on is to allow users to have a what if um, matrix that they can put in. What if I increase my production of grain by 10%? What if I moved um, my manufacturing from paper towards textiles and then see what happens in the market and how that impacts not only the, um, the, the production side bottom line, but also the impact on the economy. So what about the future? When uh, Tyler and I set out and we wrote the, the USDA grant, it was all based on, and I think it was, was it 2018, 2019, Tyler? We said, what happens when the CBD bubble busts? That's, that was our whole premise. So we did see that the CBD bubble sort of busted in terms of, um, in, in terms of planting acres of, of hemp for floral material, but it does seem that there is a future and that consumers are very, very interested in products that have hemp ingredients. But I'd like to say the media has not been our friend. Um, when you look at the consumer trends and the consumption of industrial hemp-based products, um, we see that indeed the, the, uh, we've seen an increase and then a decrease. And we're talking about uh, consumer mentions in the news, in the mass media, and searches for the terms um, hemp. And um, I'm going to go back. Hemp and CBD. So this is the number of searches on Google that, uh, that consumers have made over the years. So we see that it increased and then fell pretty sharply in, uh, in 2020, especially for the term hemp. And then we can see the mentions of hemp and CBD in the news outlets. And so I have colleagues that say, well, don't you know hemp is dead? And we're like, no, but the media has not been our friend. They grab onto the, the latest crisis and um, have stopped putting hemp and CBD high in, in uh, their mass media. But consumers are interested in hemp information. So we can see that about 90% have actually heard about information and almost one in five actually seek out actively, seek out information on, on hemp. A third, if it catches their eye and 40% uh, uh, say they've seen it, but they don't pay attention. This gives us an opportunity to increase awareness, change people's attitudes, move people's intentions and actually nudge people to consume hemp-based products. And indeed, remember about the attitudes that I, I showed you towards the variety of different products, people tend to have a positive attitude towards these products, but in order to have an attitude and knowledge, you must be aware. So I think one of the takeaways is that for, for producers and marketers and um, retailers of hemp-based products, we cannot rely on the mass media to, um, to provide that information. There's got to be a marketing budget um, included in your, uh, your strategic plans. So we saw that um, in 2014, we saw uh, no longer did we see hemp-based products being labeled as health, you know, having a health claim. And indeed, currently a non-prescription drug product containing CBD cannot be legally marketed without an approved new drug application. This is um, because the FDA uh, regulates this. So is CBD generally regarded as safe? And right now we're on the fence. We do not know. However, there's a cannabis derived products data accelerated plan, but be careful down on the right. You can see, do not use these statements when you are trying to sell your products, or you might end up with a nice warning letter, like up the uh, one in the upper right-hand corner from the FDA. So a warning letter is just the start. It's like cease and desist. And from then um, things can go bad very quickly. So I think we're really waiting on FDA to make a determination about CBD and how you can, um, how you can characterize CBD on your labels. How am I doing? Uh, we're doing pretty good. Okay, what about retail outlet? So I think that we only know about CBD sales by channel, and this is an estimate for 2022, and you can see that that 
really dark blue, almost 50% of the market is interact, uh, internet or other direct sales, followed by national, natural and specialty retailers, followed by, um, it says, uh, followed by smoke shops. No, what would this one be? This is practitioners. Um, and smoke shops and less than 1% is mass market or retail, which I think promises, um, has huge promises out there in the, the future. But this is CBD. We don't really know much about anything other than CBD sales. Lots of room for research. So what is the future of the hemp marketplace? There are opportunities beyond CBD. Watch your claims. Free publicity is not going to win the day, so don't forget about a marketing budget. Consumers are paying attention, but you have to get their attention and then give them the proper information, give them the information they want, change their attitudes, and move them towards purchase. There are positive attitudes towards all categories of hemp products, and we've looked at nine, and we know there are 50,000 different hemp products, but we, we only looked at nine wide categories. And there are opportunities across market channels, but we really only know about CBD because that's been the largest market out there. So I'd like to, to thank the team. Hopefully we're all here. Mm, University of Kentucky, you all look so professional and, and look at us in Vermont, we're kind of all scrappy. And then our, there's our team from Colorado State. I will say that both Tyler and I um, will be at NOCO next week. I think, isn't that next week already? Um, out in Colorado, um, a huge um, trade show for hemp and cannabis-based products. And um, we'll be giving a presentation based on this presentation and including others. So uh, with that, I would like to, we wanted to leave about 15 minutes. We have 10, so we've got you back on schedule, um, Heather, but we wanted to leave some time for um, questions. If anybody in the audience had them. Um, okay, we do, sorry, I was just looking at something in the chat. Yeah, I think the only one that looks scrappy in our photo is me, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone else looks fine. I look like, I look like myself, anyway. <laughs> um, I usually have your Patagonia one in the, yeah, you know, that's the one I usually use. Um, all right, so that, that was excellent and I appreciate leaving some time for questions. There is uh, a question in the Q&A box about hemp-based liquor. Are they fermenting hemp grain like corn? Do you know anything about that? So the, My sense is, that, oh, go ahead, Tyler. The short answer is yes. I have seen hemp beers out there that's fermented similar to corn. Um, so yeah, you can you can do a lot of the same things with it. I mean. Um, you know, it's more of an oil seed, so it's more like soybeans really than, than corn, but they are making hemp beers and other, um, uh, beverages out of that. You know, I've also I, seen CBD oh, added to beers. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think it's a catch-all category all the way from, um, distilling to adding to. Um, I was, I, you know, interestingly, I was, um, a couple of years ago, well, more than that now, I gave a presentation at the Vermont Brewers Association meeting around hemp. <clears throat> and I, at least what I was told at that time, and I'm sure it has not really changed, is that it's quite complicated to add um, hemp flour or CBD um, into alcoholic beverages. And there was a long list of regulatory requirements around that. And it seems that people are doing it, but I'm not, sh and kind of, especially in, um, I don't want to say microbreweries that are going out on store shelves necessarily, but um, definitely in, you know, uh, brew pubs and things like that. But it takes quite a bit to get a beer approved with new ingredients was kind of what I, what I heard for, on the alcohol side. So I'm great. But sure uh, in our right. IRI data um, set, it just seems like that is right now the fastest um, growing category from about 20,000 to 58,000. 
um, is the liquor based and other beverages as well. Hmm. Interesting. Um, okay, folks, if you have questions, get them in the chat. I'm going to launch our poll. <laughs> um, so folks, if you could take the poll, just asking if you learned anything new today, that would be great. Oh, look, everybody did. See, you did a great job. Um, <clears throat> there's another question. Uh, hosts and panelists cannot vote. I'm clicking. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Can you comment? Can either of you comment on the future of the European hemp market? Wow. So, um, so I have more of a um, a window on what I learned about the past European hemp market, which was huge. It was subsidized. They were using hemp in everything from airline panels to um, high end textiles. Um, and I do, you know, Tyler, I do not know whether or not hemp is still a largely subsidized crop in Europe, but it was, and it wasn't, it wasn't profitable unless farmers were subsidized to grow. That's, that's my recollection, but I, I do not know now. And of you course, know, China is the largest producer. Yeah, that's, that's really one of those markets. Uh, I haven't had time to really dig into the, to the European side of the market. Um, that's uh Maybe I'll get some more time to do that in 2022. So uh, I wish I had a better answer for that. I, I think that there there is definitely still an industry there. It's I think it's growing, but that's purely just uh, what I think I remember reading recently. So that could be wrong. I just want to say that there's it's like so for me it's uh, this is like a treasure trove because this industry even though we've been in it since 2014 in the, the US um, with some of the pilot programs, the, the possibilities, the products, the, um, the consumer demand, we're at the tip of the iceberg just knowing about these things, um, the types of products, what consumers want, um, you know, and from Tyler's production side, the best way to grow, which products to grow. So the impact can be huge, but I think that we have to remind ourselves that the media has not done us a favor in the last two years by saying it's, you know, hemp's already dead when we know that it isn't. And so that that's um, actually quite concerning to me that um, people believe what they read in, in the media. And yes, the number of acres uh, decrease, but the markets are growing. Yeah. And Heather, one thing I would say about the international markets in general is that it, it is something we need to keep an eye on, but it's also something that's going to be heavily impacted by our rules and regs here in the in the U.S. So let's take, for instance, we do go to 1%. Um, yes, I think that definitely cuts down on the number of uh, potential hot crops that have to be uh, destroyed. But you also have a lot of trading partners across the globe that have a 0% THC rule in their trade agreements. So how do we get around those trade agreements or are those countries just countries that we know that we we can't move any of this product into. So it does have kind of a double-edged sword there uh, to, to think about from an international trade perspective for this crop. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Um, oh boy, now they're coming in. Okay, so any movement or studies to legalize hemp products as animal feed? You, you mentioned a little something around that. You know, I think as soon as the FDA um, allows it, that market is going to take off. I heard a, I heard a fascinating presentation that Tyler was at um, uh, last year, and it was about the nutritional profile of spent seed cake after it's been pressed into oil as um, a supplement for, um, for livestock. And so that's like turning waste to value. So not only does hemp have the possibility to, you know, have the first value, you have a possibility to turn uh, waste products into value. Um, and then, uh, so I'm going to say, um, yes, I think there is a huge opportunity there. Tyler? So, yes, there's a huge market and opportunity there. And you're starting to see some states like Montana that within the state of Montana, you can now use it as hemp food, hemp food, oh, sorry, hemp grain in pet food, but nothing uh -huh. enters sorry. into the food, uh, the human food channel. Now, with that being said, you also uh, alluded to this in my presentation earlier. There has been uh, several pieces submitted to AFCO 
the, the regulatory body for that, uh, along with the FDA, to, to make hemp um, grain a feed ingredient. It's gotten a lot of pushback. They recently got a letter back, the Hemp Food or uh, Hemp Feed Coalition got a letter back uh, asking them to do even more testing uh, at even levels that the lab that they were using couldn't even detect at. Um, so there's a lot of back and forth on that. It's gonna take years and a lot of money to get that done. Now, I will say that there are a number of grants that right now have hemp feed components in them that are starting to provide the evidence that FDA and AFCO need to get these ingredients um, labeled. But keep in mind, it's you got to label it by ingredient, by species. So it is a complicated, expensive, time-consuming <clears throat> endeavor to get this done. Now, hopefully within the farm bill or something, there will be some um, congressional pieces that come through that push that along much quicker than having to go through the, the standard channels, but we'll see. So Tom, yeah, I, remind us what AFCO is. Oh, you had to ask. What oh, that, I'm sorry. Cause I, <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. The I, animal feed commodity organization or something. Yeah. Something, something, like something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one thing we've been looking at here is using the oil seed meal or the cake, the press cake uh, that would go into the, you know, animal market, we've been using it as a fertilizer um, source and comparing that to other meals because oilseed meals are generally popular organic fertility sources because they're high, high in nitrogen, organic nitrogen and, and hemp um, makes a, a good fertility source as well. And I don't think at this point it's illegal to put it back on the land. So <laughs> another option there. Um, so there's a question here about the, the National Consumer Survey. It looks like organic is important to consumers. Do you have any in additional info or observation about organic labeling in hemp? Actually, um, I, you know, I, I do, and this is um, anecdotal at, at best, but it appears that hemp-based products are still looking, at, they're, they're in that um, innovator and risk taker market. So we're in the, the beginning of a, a lot of different products for hemp. And the same consumers who are interested in hemp-based products are also interested in local, organic, and so on. Those are characteristics that fit this currently niche market. We might grow out of that market. And I think that um, the, uh, an issue here is that of course, to label uh, a product organic, you have to have certified organic land and that has to go through a, a, you know, a process. So then I think that, that the juxtaposition is, do I label it local, do I label it organic? And our uh, previous research says that, that actually local has more of a pull than, um, than organic does. So if you're looking at where this market might go into more mainstream markets after we pass through this initial um, risk takers and innovator marketplace, um, uh, organic may be less important for mass producers, but might help you with um, with niche market and capturing more value if you do invest in organic and label it as such. Interesting. So just for folks that need um, their CCA credit credits, we have a professional development credit uh, available. I put the QR code up. I'm scanning it myself. <laughs> Um, let's take one more question and then we'll move over to Steve. Um, and then hopefully Jane um, or Tyler, you can answer the last question in the, in the box. Do you see a path toward coordination with respect to fiber, fiber between European and US hemp markets? I'm gonna let Tyler take that. I don't know the answer. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's that's a great question. I, I think we have a lot to learn from the European markets. I would say the European markets are way out in front of us um, in terms of what uh, what they're doing with that. Um, I think the thing for the U.S. market is really to think about what are those high value products that we can go into for the fiber market? And, and I'm, I'm thinking beyond textiles. I'm thinking into those industrial chemical processes, uh, you know, where, where can we really capture a dollar value that's going to intrigue people to, to move into this industry? 
you know, just take a, an example. I mean, if you look at uh, one of the companies that's trying to move into Texas and they're going to cottonize that material. Well, when you cottonize it, it's a, it's a process that uh, could potentially turn that into a, uh, from a natural fiber into a, um, you know, uh, to not necessarily a natural fiber that you could sell. And Jane was talking about from a consumer side, and I'm kind of speaking out of my, out of my area here. Uh, but if it's not a natural fiber and it becomes a, a synthetic type fiber because of the cottonization process and chemicals that go along with it, you know, it, it, it does, it isn't as alluring as if it was a traditional nat natural product. So I think we need to think about how we do that. We also need to think about how the processes we're utilizing to ret this. I mean, there's chemical retting, there's, uh, you can ensile it to degum it. Uh, there's lots of different pieces that, that need to go along with that. So we need to think about how we become more efficient. I think we can move beyond where Europe is at in the reading process. I think we can we can do some other processes that add value. So that's what I'm hopeful. Um, but I still need to learn more about the European market. Uh, maybe one of these days when I get the U.S. market figured out, I'll, I'll de delve into the European market. Great. Well, there is one more question in the Q&A box, but um, I'm going to have, have you folks answer that type of answer in. Um, and I want to thank you so much for kicking off the conference and uh, good luck at NOCO. That's next week, I think. Is that correct? Yep. And, um, delivering all this great information there. Thanks for um, having all right. us, Heather. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, I, I want to roll into uh, another program that we've had going on at the University of Vermont under the direction of uh, Steve Costell. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to let him talk about the program. Steve is a professor here at UVM in the Community Development and Applied <clears throat> Economics Department. And I've been working with Steve for a few years on various hemp related um, research and outreach. And I'll let him talk about his program right now if he's on. Yep, I'm here. Oh, perfect. All right. So long Take as you can it hear away. me. Yeah, I can hear you and see you. So be careful. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I can, well, I can see the presentation. And I'm just gonna change one more thing to full screen mode so you don't have to see the menus around it, maybe. It's still showing, there we go. Just well, good morning, everybody. Minute. Indeed. Um, I see that at least three out of the four presenters that will be uh, talking about this project are online. There might be one that'll be showing up yet. Um, nonetheless, good morning. My name is Stephen Costell. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Community Development, Applied Economics uh, in the College of Agriculture and Life Science at the University of Vermont, uh, where we're excited to be the host institution for the USDA sponsored research and extension experiential undergraduate learning fellowship program, or uh, more easily known as the REEU. Um, this immersive program combines workshops, field experiences, and research to better understand the specific applications and potentials of industrial hemp, where students gain transferable skills related to basic research, production, processing, opportunity recognition, problem solving, prototyping, and commercialization. So just a quick nod to the team of uh, uh, individuals that contribute to this. Uh, so myself, Dr. Jane Kolodinsky is co-PI, uh, Dr. Heather Barbie. Dr. Eric von Wettberg, Dr. Sarah Heiss, and Natasha Baranow as project manager. Um, and then additional project support from uh, Michael Moser, uh, Giovanna Sassi, Hilary Emick, Scott Lewins, Hannah Lacasse, and Cerise Rafik. Um, it takes a team to make one of these projects move forward, as you might imagine. In 2021, the summer of 2021, we were uh, Grace with welcoming 14 undergraduates. Um, so each summer from 2021 to 2023, selective undergraduate students from US institutions representing diverse academic backgrounds are provided with an opportunity to conduct interdisciplinary research on the cultural, economic, and scientific roles of the agricultural transition toward industrial hemp production 
Uh, this morning, we're going to be joined with four of these fellows uh, that will talk about the four different uh, concentrations within the program uh, that students had an opportunity to uh, participate in. And so those four students are going to be uh, Michael Ferrosis, uh, Anaya Ware, Isabel Picardo, and Asia Ellison. Um, so this morning we'll be starting off with uh, Michael. And Michael is a sophomore biology major at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, who is pursuing research opportunities in field ecology. So Michael, are you online with us? I am, good morning. Good morning. Um, so I will let you take it from there and I'll gladly forward slides for you. So just cue me. Perfect. We'll see if it forwards. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Michael Ferrosis. My other three partners from last summer are not here right now. And we focus on agricultural production, specifically the difficulties of what it means to produce hemp and what it means to get into the industry. So I'll scroll forward then. So just a brief history of hemp, assuming you guys are familiar with most of this information, but it's defined by a low THC concentration, which is a misconception or which relates to a misconception, which I'm gonna be talking about shortly. In 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act placed a heavy tax on hemp and effectively acted as a ban, which greatly decreased the sale of hemp in the US until the 1970 Con Controlled Substances Act which actually considered it a class one substance and banned hemp along with other cannabis, which pretty much depleted any possibilities of research and contributes to the little information we have today about the hemp industry and hemp as a crop. In 2014, the Agricultural Act allowed for experimental growth of hemp in limited and regulated volumes. And in 2018, the US Farm Bill finally allowed hemp to be grown as a commodity. So only recently has it been able to be grown and sold, and only recently has research been able to be conducted on it as a crop. And this led to a lot of harmful myths about hemp and created an industry that is very difficult to break into currently. Sorry, I'll just give you a thumbs up. Thank you. So some common misconceptions about hemp. It is not psychotropic. It's actually defined by a low THC concentration, so it cannot get you high. And this was the source of a lot of harmful regulations, specifically the Marijuana Tax Act, which treated hemp as a drug when it really is a material and hemp for fiber production is a huge part of hemp growing. Another myth is that it's an easy industry to break into and make money. You can just grow it and sell it, but you actually need to find a market and there's a lot of testing and processing capabilities which I'm gonna talk about later, which need to be undergone before you can just grow and sell hemp. And it is not an easy crop to grow. It, although it is a very good cycle crop, it still depletes the soil of nitrogen and it does have many pests, which is a myth as it is not resistant to a lot of pests. And on the next slide, there's just a few pests that we saw. One of my group members actually had a camera. So we took these beautiful photos of some common pests. You can see the Japanese beetle in the middle red-winged blackbird, longhorn beetle, aphids. So those are just some of the pests that we saw on Heather Darby's farm that were eating the plants. And you can see a picture of a plant that was, whose leaves were destroyed due to these pests. And so all these misconceptions culminated in when the farm bill passed in 2018, the hemp industry boomed. Everybody wanted to cash into this industry and be able to sell mass volumes of hemp which obviously doesn't work because creating a huge supply lowers the demand and drives down costs. So in 2018, the registered acres boomed from about 3,000 to about 9,000. So it a little less than tripled. And then this oversupply led to a market crash. And by 2021, there were about 350 registered acres, which is a huge decrease and was harmful for the industry due to everyone jumping in at once. So now these are just some things that we did when we were in the lab is on the farm, we collected samples of hemp, specifically flour to test it for low CBD and THC concentrations. 
And we did this using high pressure liquid chromatography. We mixed it in the solution and then put it in the machine. And this is one of the limitations is that you need a certified lab to you be used as proof of compliance with the Vermont hemp rules to show that you have a THC concentration of under 0.3%. And there's only two certified labs in Vermont and they don't even conduct all of the required studies for hemp. So that's one of the limitations. And that can just be shown how difficult it is when you grow hemp to be able to even legally sell it in the area because there's only two labs that can get you that information. And there's also no industrial decorticators which is need to process hemp in mass volumes. And that's definitely a limitation because if you grow hemp, you're gonna be able to most effectively sell it once it's processed and you cannot process it, process it without an industrial decorticator. So what's happening locally is we visited Heather Darby at Borderview Farm and they're conducting research on hemp as a cover crop, as its effect on soil quality and the soil quality nearby and far away from hemp plants, which is some of the samples that we collected and analyzed in the lab using eco plates. They're doing variety trials and stuff like that. So really just getting the information about hemp as a crop into the field, which was not able to be researched in the past few decades up until 2014, 2018. We also visited Jesse Lucas and GMG Farms. He has a Dutch glass greenhouse and produces hemp commercially specifically for CBD. And he had a great first year when he had access to European markets, but then was met with later difficulties due to the lack of domestic infrastructure. And one of the things he focuses on is soil health and tries to maintain a robust microbiome in the soil of his farm, which is definitely something that should be researched more. And then we were presented to by Brandon McFarlane and Travis Samuels of Zion Growers, who are in the midst of constructing an industrial decorticator, which can really create a market for hemp now that there's a way for local farmers to process it. And just as a conclusion, what needs to happen, there needs to be a shift from these oversaturated CBD markets to growers who know what they're doing and are willing to produce hemp and have a way to test it and produce it. We need industrial hemp processors and more labs to make it easier for producers to actually get their hemp into the market in a legal manner. There needs to be more awareness of hemp's uses. Something we did was we conducted a survey just to see how aware people were of hemp and it didn't seem like they were very aware of its uses. So this could definitely create a consumer market and there just needs to be more research like Heather Darby's doing and like Jesse Lucas is doing on the niches and viability of hemp as a crop. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the next speaker is gonna be Anaya Ware. Anaya is attending Prairie View A&M University as a graduating senior from the College of Agriculture and Human Sciences. Anaya's concentration area is in plant and soil science with the intent of entering the cannabis industry as a plant cultivator or grower. So Anaya, welcome. Hello, good morning. Um, he already covered the intro, so I'm gonna just get right into it. It's gonna be a little quicker. Um, again, this is assuming that there's already pre-existing knowledge about hemp as a production crop and so forth. So essentially our project was broken into three different parts. Our first part, we analyzed the actual hemp biomass. And then for the second part of the experiment, we sampled the phylosphere. And then there was another part, sorry, where we analyzed the actual soil microbiome itself. So to get into the first part, analyzing the hemp biomass, we just conducted a simple ELISA test, which is basically an enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assay to test if there's a presence of a certain antibody that is associated with a certain virus. We're looking for two viruses from samples collected at Borderview Farm directed by Dr. Heather Darby, as previously stated. And simple, it was seriously basically just a series of antigens and antibodies that was applied to plant tissue to again test if there was a presence of a antibody or antigen related to a virus. There was a... 
Oh, I'm waiting for the results. <laughs> yeah. The second one. Mm -hmm. And this is just a simple slide showing the, the, the possibility of a variance between the samples. So for this one, it was focusing on the Hawaiian haze strain. This was collected by one of the members, Stephanie Izuzaga. And it was basically sent showing that all samples were tested healthy in the same strain except for one. So there is a possibility that even within the same strain, we can see a variance of like possibilities of a presence of the virus. Okay, so for the second part, as I said, we analyzed the soil microbiome. And for this, we conducted, again, a series of soil DNA extractions. Um, the advice students, myself, Amir, and Stephanie, we first grinded up the soil samples using mortals and pestles, and then we um, broke it down physically, mechanically, and chemically to then isolate the DNA and purify it to actually see and analyze what is in the soil DNA samples. And so from my understanding of the whole program itself, it was, they were really keen on emphasizing the importance of a transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary correlation. So we wanted to ask ourselves, like, how does this correlate outside of the lab or outside of science? And so for this portion, we wanted to focus on environmental stakeholders, like environmental activists, sustainability alliances, and even consumers. So basically, how does the genetic plant and soil testing contribute to knowledge within the whole entire industry? So basically, if research like this is done, consistently and efficiently, and then that for those results are projected to the public and to researchers and producers, we will have a better understanding and a better knowledge of not only how to produce, but how do we produce this in a way that is sustainable to the environment and ourselves? Because we all have to live here and we all have to coexist here. For the last part of the experiment, we sampled and scouted the phylosphere for different pests and um, different viruses or bacteria. So basically, as I said, we sampled for different pests and different um, viruses. This was done using uh, different samples from tissues from leaf tissues we sampled using swabs and capturing images just to see critical again pests or viruses so for the results of the swabbing for the presence of a fungus or bacteria as I, we just used a q-tip swab and then placed it into enclosed petri dishes and allowed those to sit over a period of time so that we can then the presence of Pseudomonas fluorescence under a UV fluorescence machine. Um, if, if you want different pictures or additional information, I will attach my email in the bottom, just if you wanna see different results and how some of those actually looked. Okay, and then this was just some uh, information and pictures on the common insects that we found. It'll kind of piggyback off what Michael said earlier. So we found a common Japanese beetle, a snipe fly, a ladybug, and of course your aphids. And these are all just separate images that were captured or taken. And then just a brief information pieces on each of those. And again, I wanted to, well, we wanted to emphasize the importance of the transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary correlation. So how does the understanding of these pests and beneficial species contribute to small farms and the public again? So the research that has been done has been awarded through grants and different forms of finances. And the information found from the resource made public to consumers and small growers allowing them to be able to access that will again contribute to the way things are being produced and how efficiently they can manage their money, manage different, different production um, aspects that go into producing the crop and marketing and selling and so forth. And then we, we also did uh, a little bit of microscopy towards the end of mycorrhizae in the, in the plant itself. 
And so, again, assuming that everybody knows what mycorrhizae is or just knows a little bit that goes into production, mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus that actually works in symbiosis. Well, can be beneficial. I mean, I could have myself. That works in symbiosis with many plants. Um, it supports their root structure and just their overall growth. And so for this, we found and focused on two types of uh, funguses or mycorrhizae. We focus on our buscular mycorrhizae and also ectomycorrhizae mycorrhizae, sorry. And these are just simple, quick images of those. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Anaya. I know Isabel is in the participants, but she's not listed as a panelist and she just messaged me that she's not able to uh, access the audio or video for her presentation. Uh, I'll work on that. Okay. So I will do the introduction nonetheless. So Isabel Pitardo is a senior at Cedar Crest College majoring in studio art. Her interests in sustainability and art are merged in the collection of materials for her work, which attracted her to hemp as an ideal fiber source. And we'll wait for Isabel to show up here. And hopefully I didn't see if um, Asia had been able to log in successfully. So that would be the other one to look for. She's on now. She should be able to unmute herself. Yeah. Can you repeat that second name? Asia Ellison. Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay. And then Isabel. Hello. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> there you are. Uh, All right, Isabel. So you have the floor. All right. I'm sorry. All right, so in our lab, we, we can skip to the first slide. <laughs> um, in our lab, we work with you, Steve Castell, as well as my other partners that are not here. Um, we use paper as a model due to its ubiquity and our availability to the resources to process the fiber in order to make the paper. And here we wanted to investigate the two fiber streams, which are herd and BAST, um, and do some mechanical processing. And to process it, this is going to be very brief because <laughs> the process is actually very long. So what you do to whichever fiber you want to cut it down, and then it's cooked and then that's beaten and you're gonna get your fiber from there. And once that's done, um, you essentially pull it into sheets and yeah. And to do so, we use the Western style paper making. And for that, we used our Western style mold and deco, our Reno two pound Hollander beater, a 50 ton hydraulic press and to dry the sheets of paper that we created, we used a forced air restraint dry box. All right, we can continue. Um, up on this slide, we have uh, one of the cultivars that we, that we process as well as the herd. And when we're processing this, we're taking a look at the cook time and the beating time, just so that way we can replicate the results if need be. And uh, from there, we can do a little comparison the herd took longer to cook, but a shorter time to beat. And the bass, the bass fibers took a shorter time to cook, but longer beating time. And this differences, these differences can be attributed to the properties of the fiber. Um, as the herd is like stronger than the bass and the differences in beating time can be attributed to the length of the fiber, herd having a shorter fiber and the structure of the bass. So after it's all cooked and we have the recipes, we have our results. Um, so we worked with Cerise and she provided some SEM images. Uh, she was developing research for, um, excuse me, uh, hydrophobic coating for food products. And so to combine our works, we were looking at the porosity and the topography of the paper. So our control group was a hemp blunter that was imported from Spain. And this was processed already like chemically bleached and it already came pre-prepped. So, yeah, next. And then the herd fiber that we 
produce or process produced a a soft and smooth paper and uh, you can feel it yeah small and smooth and from the s the SM, SM images on the right we can observe the length of the fiber and the porosity that is present and we can go next we can move on oh oh there we go so then we had our best fiber and again you can observe the length and the porosity of the paper this one this one you can see like the intermingling of the fibers because as, as i mentioned before they're longer and we can move on and we did a trial with the herd and the bast and this produced also a smooth paper and with much less opacity opacity porosity <laughs> and um, that smooth characteristic of the herd as well. Okay. And this is just comparison pictures. So we can see, take a closer look with the hemp. You can see the porosity and how smooth it is. Mm, yeah. So after we completed our lab research, we then began to get, consider our stakeholders or possible applications and implications of our work, um, such as production, sourcing, opportunities, demands from consumers, researchers, and farmers. And so we focused our attention on areas that we had knowledge about, whether from the program or before. So we decided, we came up with creating complementary materials to use in conjunction of paper products. Um, as I mentioned before, Cerise was working to create food grade coatings from lignin, which could be used for food packaging, and that could be paired with the paper that we have made. Um, utilizing the natural qualities of the papers to create regenerative products that can be used in farming. And paper can be broken down, so a possible application of this would be development of an alternative to black plastic uh, coverings created from herd, which could break down and be tilled into the soil. And this can also create micro manufacturing opportunities in rural communities. And uh, yeah, we would like to thank. Oh, that's it. There you go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Yes. So our last presenter is going to be Asia Ellison. Asia is a sophomore in animal, poultry, and veterinary science uh, at Tuskegee University, graduating with the class of 2024. Uh, Post-graduation, she is considering a veterinary school with the goal of becoming a mixed practice veterinarian and currently participating as work study in a multi-institutional research hemp project. So Asia, good morning. Hi, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Asia Ellison. I'm a sophomore animal science major at Tuskegee University. Um, today, I will be speaking on behalf of my group, which includes Emily Leonard, who attends University of Massachusetts Amherst and UVM's very own Manuka Rai and Carolina Debye Winokur. Um, our group's research revolved around the consumer's attitude and awareness of hemp products at the Burlington Farmers Market. Next slide, please. So here we have a brief timeline showing the history of hemp. As you can see, dating all the way back to 8,000 BC, hemp has ancient origins. Um, if we fast forward to the 20th century, hemp was used as a resource until its ban in 1937, followed by years of various regulations. In the 21st century, hemp research became legalized and hemp production is now prevalent. Oh, you're fine. Okay, so upon beginning our own research, we reviewed a study previously done that revealed high rates of support for hemp production in the state of Vermont and awareness of at least one type of hemp product. So this little pie chart on the side exhibits the percentage of hemp used categorized by products. Our group's focus was to determine the consumer's point of view of hemp products from a much smaller sample size. Next slide, please. Um, so using two research methods referred to as convenient sampling and intercept surveying, our entire cohort completed 144 samples in a three hour span from both vendors and customers at the Burlington Farmers Market. My group then coded the qualitative data into quantitative data using numerical codes and with the assistance of Dr. Kalandinsky and Michael Moser, we used SPSS for, for statistical analysis, specifically looking at univariate and bivariate analyses. Okay, 
Our group speculated that demographics would have a great effect on the results of our research and our survey included questions regarding residence, age, education, household income and composition, gender and political affiliation. The data of the demographics revealed that many of our participants were highly educated, affluent Democrats and have a childless household. Next slide, please. Okay, so here we have our first graph exhibiting the data collected. Participants were asked if they had heard of the following hemp products. As you can see, over 90% of participants have heard of hemp CBD and clothing and textiles. A large number have heard of hemp products, hemp food products, excuse me, personal care products and rope, and about half have heard of hemp paper. Majority have not heard of hemp construction materials and plastics, likely due to their lack of availability. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, here you can see the data evaluated regarding the participants attitude towards hemp products. So majority of the participants had a positive attitude towards the products, highly positive attitudes and neutral attitudes following. I'd like to note that the construction materials and plastics have the highest rate of I don't know answers, this data being consistent with the previous slide. So those who answered no and I don't know were actually not asked any further questions. Okay. Participants were asked if they have used each product before. Here we can see a large portion of people have used hemp CBD, clothing and textiles, food products, and personal care products, whereas less people have used hemp rope, construction materials, paper, and plastic. Each participant were asked if they would use each hemp product in the future all of which had high rates of yes, showing that consumers are open to using these products, even if they have never used them before. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so our, a portion of our survey was dedicated to search behavior in which participants were asked to choose which statement describes them best. Most participants said that they pay attention to hemp products if it catches their eye or that they have heard or seen information but do not pay attention. And then a smaller amount of people said that they actively seek information or that they have never heard or seen any information on hemp products. Okay. Um, you can actually just move on to the next one. I don't think I need this one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so um, our myriad of data allowed us to conclude that demographics, particularly income, education, and political affiliation did not have a consistent relationship across hemp products as we speculated. However, search preferences do have a significant across hemp products. Those who actively searched for information and paid attention to information that caught their eye tend to have a positive attitude towards hemp products. This conclusion exhibits the potential for expansion of hemp products, which could be achieved by marketers providing more information to the public to increase positive perception. Um, that will include my presentation, and I'd like to acknowledge um, Hannah Lacoste, Steve Costell, Michael Moser, Dr. Kolodinsky, along with my groupmates, Emily Manuka and Carolina. Thank you, everyone. Thank each of you presenters. And if there's any questions, I'm sure they'd be happy to field them. That was great. It was really good to see all the hard work that the students put in um, over a very short period of time. And um, I know we can all, all appreciate that. And we heard right at the beginning from the students that we need, we need more research. Um, and it's exciting to see young folks now able to <laughs> conduct research in hemp as well. And I know that was exciting to the students too.